When I was in seminary, Kelly and I joined a really incredible church. It was probably, as far as churches I've attended, uh, one of my favorite in Joshua, Texas. Anybody ever heard of Joshua, Texas? Really? Wow. Joshua. The locals called it Joshua. I don't know why. Because locals always got to sound, you know, snooty, I guess. Like, so you change Joshua to Joshua. I could never call it that. We loved everything about this church. And in fact, the church that licensed me, whatever that means, really, honestly, I don't know. But um, David Hampton was their pastor. I have tremendous respect for him. We loved everything about this church except one thing we had a problem with. And it was their evangelism strategy. Now, to be fair, in the context of the setting, uh, in the early to mid-90s, this was it. This is just what you did, okay? Uh, things have changed and for the better. But this is what you did. It was called Evangelism Explosion. Anybody heard of Evangelism Explosion? It's probably about an inch thick booklet that you've got to work your way through. And if you can, it was like a seminary course. If you can memorize all the scriptures, all the illustrations, all the argument rebuttals, all the key questions, you should get a degree for that thing. I'm just telling you, it took weeks. And basically what we would go is we would go in to a class, we would sit down with partners, and we would practice rehearsing the scriptures. And we basically, you know, if you just pulled all the covers back, you say we've got a script. We were memorizing the script, okay? And we had two key questions, evangelism uh, explosions, based on two key questions that you look for an opportunity to ask. And the first question is this. Really seriously, you could ask a stranger this question or somebody that you knock on the door of their home to and say, if you died today, now that's a turnoff for me right there, right? You just, that's not the right way to get my attention. If I died today, uh, do you know for sure, that's the second turnoff, very few people are willing to say they're for sure about anything, uh, that you would go to heaven? <laughs> that was the first key question. Now, that's not good enough because if they said yes... Uh, or if they said no, you were taught to ask a follow-up question. The follow-up question is this. Okay, so you know that you're going to go to heaven. Uh, can you tell me why? If you stood at heaven's gate... <laughs> serious. I'm serious. It sounds humorous for me to say this now. If that person says, yeah, I feel certain. You say, well, that's... In your mind, you're like, that's not good enough. We've got to really check this out. We're going to probe a little further. So the second question is, you know where I'm going. Don't you remember this? The second key question is... What? It's, all right, if you stood at the, just, let's just say, you stood there and Peter's at the gate, like we all talk about. He's the gatekeeper of heaven, which he's not necessarily, that's irrelevant. Uh, and he said, why should I let you? And God said to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? <laughs> I, I'm a seminary student. I answered that question wrong the first time it was asked to me. Because I was so put off by it. I was like, what? what I, I don't know what to say because, you know, and I thought all the right things, but I didn't think that was the answer they were looking for. Ooh, listen, we went through this probably a 12-week study. I don't know how long it is, but near the end of the study, we were, went out in teams of four or something like that, and we just went and canvassed Joshua, Texas. We started knocking on doors, knocking on doors. Now, listen, think about this. I never thought about this, but it explains a lot. Say you're sitting in your living room, and you're comfortably watching your favorite television show, your sports team, or whatever. Now, you just imagine that, and you get knock, 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 or ding, dong, and there's four strangers standing on your porch. First of all, you're already irritated, right, because you had to get up and leave your television because they didn't have DVRs, and they didn't, you didn't push pause. You just missed the television show, right? So there's four strangers. You're missing your television show. They say, hi, and they're exuberant about their church, and let's just say me because I had to do this. Hi, I'm Casey Ingold. I'm with uh, Joshua uh, I'm not going to name the church, uh, the church in Joshua, and uh, we're just out meeting our neighbors, which is a lie. That was a lie. We weren't out meeting our neighbors, and they didn't call it a lie, but listen, looking back, I was not out there meeting our neighbors. I was fulfilling a duty and an obligation and getting trained. That's what I was doing, and they knew that. And I said, hi, and da-da-da, do you have a church home anywhere, da-da-da, and I'm looking for the question. I'm looking for the crack, and sometimes there wasn't a crack, so you just make a crack, and you just say, right in the middle of an awkward point where the person's wanting to go sit down. Before you go sit down, can I ask you a question? But if you died today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? And I'm like, I was watching CSI, and now you're asking me. That. Really? Seriously, Monday night football? And you want to know if I died today, if I'd go to heaven, if I know that? You know? I mean, come on. And if they say, yeah, just to get rid of you, some people did. Yeah, or I don't care, or whatever. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before you go, can I ask you another question? And some people literally would say, well, you just did, so that's your second question, so I'm out of here. So, there was, okay, but, but if you did die today, and you did go to heaven, and then God asked you, why should I let me into heaven, what would you say? And they just look at you like, seriously, are you asking me these questions? You've been on my porch for five minutes, and you want me to justify how I'm going to get into heaven? Or if I know for sure? Is it any wonder we got invited one house out of about 30 that night? 
one broken, lonely person that said, I don't care why you're here, just come on in. <laughs> but seriously, seriously, is it any wonder that we led very few people to faith in Jesus? Now, out of sheer numbers, out of sheer numbers, and you don't know why, we did have one or two people out of, we had to send about 10 teams. I mean, we canvassed all of Joshua, Can to be, or Joshua Kansas that night. And listen, I think a couple people did profess faith, and there were a couple conversations. But we went to over 100 homes. This is not an effective evangelism strategy, is it? It's a hook. It's a sales pitch. It's something that people are averse to. I'm going to tell you for sure I'm averse to it. If you came to my home from a different church, an evangelical church in, in uh, Topeka, Kansas, and you knocked on my door uninvited, and I was sitting and I was relaxing, I was kind of debriefing the whole day, and I just was looking forward to my hour of peace, and you knocked on my door, I would be so irritated. I don't care why you came to my door. Now, if it's a church member, you're saying, Casey, I love you and I want to be here. That's different. But if you're trying to hook me and get me to go to your church, I'm not going to be happy about that. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm that way. I, did, I wouldn't want it. I wouldn't want it. And they didn't either. So a lot of people, listen, unfortunately, many people still think this is the best approach to how to influence people and invite people into the life of Jesus. And it's tragically wrong. It's really not a good approach. It, there are times, listen, I would never exclude this movement and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And if he prompts you to go to somebody's house or if he prompts you to go door to door in your neighborhood, that's fine. I'm not saying it's never, never, never a good thing. But I'm saying as a strategy, as a methodology, as something that a church should embrace and teach congregations to do, this is not it. Didn't work then. It certainly won't work now. Hopefully in this series we're getting a clear picture that there's a lot more to it than offering people a chance to punch their tickets to heaven because that's really all we talk to them about. How do you get to heaven? Do you know you're going to go to heaven? Are you sure you're going to go to heaven? Can I tell you? Because I know how you can get to heaven. It comes across kind of arrogant, doesn't it? It's all true. We do know how you can get to heaven. Everybody in this church should have heard how you can get to heaven. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. We know that. But when you present the gospel as a ticket to get punched, to get to heaven, you're not presenting the whole gospel. You're presenting the, the culmination of the gospel. But people can put the culmination. Does anybody in here have a problem with procrastination besides me? I am the world's greatest procrastinator. It's an art form for me. I could write a book on it. If it were a healthy thing, I could promote it and become very wealthy. I'm certain about that. But it's not. It kills my life when I do it. And, and it kills people's spiritual life when you think, well, I can go to heaven when I die. If I pray this prayer, I can get my ticket punched, and then I can live, and I can just go to heaven when I die. And we got a bunch of people sitting in churches today that think that they have their ticket punched to heaven, but they don't have the whole gospel, which is a revolutionary life invasion of Jesus Christ into your world right here and now. The kingdom of God is present and at hand. It's not someday when you die and go to heaven. It is that, but it's more. So we've got to get something different. Jesus has got this figured out, doesn't he? He tells us what it's about. And this series is aimed at that, about invited. You're invited. You're invited to more than say, can I get a ticket to heaven? Can I pray a prayer that will, that will alleviate me from all of my guilt and get me to heaven when I die? True. You can pray a prayer. You can invite Christ into your life. You can surrender your life to him. You can move into that. But there's more to it. And the problem that Satan has caused in our world is they cut off the front end of that you're invited into a new life in Christ here and now. And instead of just a new life in heaven. And then we get a bunch of people walking around this world who say they are believing Christ following Christians. But all they have to offer is a hope to go to heaven. And people right now, your neighbors, your co-workers, your fellow students are broken now. Their marriage is hurt now. Their finances are disasters now. They're facing terminal illnesses now. They have broken relationships at work now. They don't have a purpose or sense of meaning now. And if you just say, get your ticket punched to heaven, and they say, but what about now? And you just say, hold on till you get there. It doesn't do much for them. Jesus never did that, by the way, did he? If they had leprosy, he didn't say, hey, man, that's sorry. But you know what? I'm going to let you go to heaven when you die. If they were blind, he didn't say, well, you know, just get a friend to lead you around. And you'll see good when you get to heaven. No, what did he do? He healed people right now. He inaugurated relationships right now that would last into eternity, that would culminate into eternity. But he never said or never alluded, hang on, it'll get better when you get to heaven. He said, right now, enter the flow. Get into the current. The kingdom of, the kingdom of God is here. 
and at hand. And it's here and at hand in your life, whether you're cognizant of that fact, you're aware of that reality or not. Maybe the kingdom amounts to going to church on Sunday for an hour and 15 minutes and calling it good for you. But we want to make it very, very difficult for you to stay that way. We want to make it very, very difficult for you to think or to you to buy into that notion that it's just about an hour weekly commitment or going to a group even or, or reading your Bible even that it's much more than that. It's all pervasive. Here's what we said so far in this service. Jesus is inviting us to follow him. Not a pastor, not a church, not a denomination, not a political affiliation, but follow him. And if we do, he takes on the responsibility for transforming our lives, for changing us. And he doesn't just change what we do or what we talk about or how we talk or how we behave or our morals. He changes our hearts. When we are invited to follow Jesus, he changes us from the inside out. And when you get changed from the inside, the outside is inevitable to change. If you change the outside, the inside gets ignored and you live in conflict and contradiction to your heart. And that's a miserable way to live. But Jesus said, follow me, I'll change your heart. I'll change you from the inside out. And that means that you become more and more like Jesus. Not more and more like a preacher, not more and more like a singer, not more and more like a deacon, not more and more like an elder, but more and more like Jesus. That's why the Gospels are so important to read because you get to see the one and interact with the one that you are becoming like. He's transforming you into the very image of him. So we follow him. He changes us into more and more the kind of person he was. So what kind of person was Jesus? What kind of, was he just a nice guy? Do you see some pictures of Jesus that make you go, I don't know if I want to be like Jesus. <laughs> Have you ever seen the pale, stale figure in this dark, dreary atmosphere? He looks like he has not seen the light of day for, for months and that his hair is just this flowing flock of greasy looking hair and his eyes look sunken in his head and he's praying and you think you know if that's your image of Jesus you're convoluted because that's a picture and if you don't you say well, I don't want to be like Jesus because I think he was not I don't know if I want to be like Jesus but he was a nice guy I don't know if he had a lot of fun or maybe he was just really stiff and rigid or maybe he was he was you know, walking three inches off the ground. He, didn't, he wasn't a real guy or something. I don't know if I want to be like Jesus. What was Jesus really like? We have four Gospels, four accounts of his life and who he was as a person. And in, in our groups, we're encouraged to learn Jesus as a part of the Bell's challenge. To learn Jesus. And to learn Jesus, read the Gospels regularly. You read all of your Bible, but read the Gospels regularly because you get to learn Jesus. Not about him, not just about him. You can, you can stop short and just learn about Jesus or you can learn Jesus. And here's what Jesus synopsized himself as. He said, if you follow me, come follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. So follow the logic here because it is logic from scripture. The Bible says this, if we follow Jesus, we become like him. What was Jesus like? He described himself as a fisher of men. He said another way one time, he said, I've come to seek and save the lost. Other time he said it's the sick who need a doctor and I'm, pursuit, I'm in pursuit of spiritually broken and hurting and sick people. Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. That may sound kind of strange. So what exactly is a fisher of men? It, let me tell you what it's not. It's not Casey Ingold as a 23-year-old seminary student knocking on doors in Joshua, Texas fishing, fishing for people. Oh, I was fishing, but I had a hook. And I wanted you to, it wasn't good enough, listen, I would have said it was, but it wasn't good enough if you prayed a prayer and didn't come to our church, because the goal really was church recruitment. That was really, now I knew better than that, I knew better than that, but that was really driving, that was the driving force. So, what we're going to look at is Mark 1.17 one more time, this is our last time to look at this passage of scripture as a congregation for a little while, but uh, if you ever want to know if, I've, if I touch a scripture more than once, you can talk to Roger Flanagan, who has all of the passages that I've preached for for the last nine years. I'm serious. If I want to know, Roger, can, have I preached on this? I can call him and he can say, yeah, you preached on it this date, this date, and this date. So that's kind of cool. How many times have I preached on Mark 117? Do you know? About seven times. About seven times in nine years. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm proud of me. It's <laughs> a great passage. Man, how do you go wrong preaching this stuff? Would you stand with me and let's read it one more time. You follow along as I read. I'm going to start in verse 16 today. We'll get a run and start at it. Listen and let it sink in like you've never heard it before. Like it's a glass of cold water on a hot day or a warm coffee on a cold day maybe today. As 
he, Jesus, was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers, fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Father, today we want to ask you to penetrate our hearts, not just our heads, and make us as a congregation to become more like you. In Jesus' great name, amen. Thank you. This is a promise. If we accept his invitation to follow him, when we follow him, we become like him. And Jesus was and is today in constant pursuit of people. Jesus was, always, and is now, and will be until the inauguration of a new heaven and a new earth, always be in pursuit of people. Not just in pursuit of people to make them feel guilty, but to, in pursuit to invest in and direct themselves toward the best interest of the individual and the person. Inviting them into a relationship with them, joining the journey that leads to an entirely new life, an entirely new way of living this new life. He describes the new life as a life of fishing for men. Fisher of men is not what we oftentimes think. It's probably not at all what you have in mind. Uh, that is, we're not salesmen who go door to door like I did in seminary. We're not champions of debate, arguing others into submission before us, our, our perceived superior intellect. Uh, we're not actors who pretend to be people that we really aren't, living lives that we really don't live in an effort to coerce people to believe and behave and even vote like we vote or behave or believe and join our church ultimately, right? That's not what a fisher of men is. To live as a fisher of men is to live with a heart, a heart that is set upon the immediate and ultimate best interest of other people. You cannot make your heart become that. You can't make your heart be like that. What do I do? Follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you become like that. Because that's how his heart was. That's who he was. He was always living so much so that he lived to the very point of dying for the best interest of people who hated him. That's ultimate love. And so the Bible says, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and laid his life down for us. Ultimate, ultimate love. He was in pursuit of people, in the best interest of people constantly. So becoming a fisher of men is a new kind of life that leads us to authentically care for authentically care for, humbly serve, and clearly invite others to know and follow Jesus themselves. There is a tendency, and we have a problem brewing in, in the shift in the culture of the church and the focus of the church today. I believe this with all my heart, so just, just follow along with me. You don't have to agree. But I believe we always swing the pendulum too far. In reaction in the 80s and 90s and maybe even earlier, in reaction to becoming an inward, self-focused, ministry-driven church that, that produced a massive generation of consumer-minded consumer Christians, in the effort to rebut that, we swing the culture, the, the cultural pendulum all the way out to say, no, go be an externally focused church and serve other people. And that's true, right? It's just that when you do that to the exclusion of taking care of and loving each other, you get very, very imbalanced. And, and today what we're talking about is making sure the pendulum is at the right place in terms of external focus and internal care and love for other people. So becoming a fisher of men means that we care for other people authentically. It means we serve other people humbly, not, not with proud arrogance saying, look how good I am to serve you, but it also means that we invite others clearly to know and follow Jesus. So the question then becomes, how do we invite them? We'll talk about all of it, but ultimately, how do we invite people to join us on the journey of following Jesus? When the pendulum's too far outward, we just say, well, we'll just, go, we'll just go authentically care and humbly serve them and leave the rest up to them. Then you become a social gospel, a social service gospel. Uh, we just go love people. We don't really ever talk about Jesus because we, we don't make them th get the wrong idea. So we just love and serve. We give them food. We give them time. We fix their stuff. We, we minister to them, but we never invite them. That's the wrong focus right there. That's the pendulum swung too far. So that's what we said. We authentically care, a genuine concern for other people. We humbly serve them, a, a, a humbly, not for our arrogant you know, reputation or anything like that, but then we clearly invite them to know and follow the Jesus that is prompting us to authentically care and genuinely serve or humbly serve. So here's what John says in 1 John. He says, we proclaim to you, listen to this, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. That's what John said in 1 John. 
We proclaim to you what we've seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship, so that you also may have fellowship with us, John says. We're sharing with you what we're sharing with you based on what we've seen and heard so that you can have the same kind of fellowship that we have. What's that fellowship? Well, our fellowship, he says, is with the Father and with the Son and with the Spirit, of course. We write this to make our joy complete. So how do we invite people? How do we invite people on the journey? How do we do that? What pro no, it's not EE -E style. This is not knock on doors and play a numbers game of listen, you if you just knock on enough doors, somebody's gonna let you in, right? Odds are. There are enough lonely and hurting people that'll let you in. And I'm not saying again. The Holy Spirit gets to set the agenda. I'm just telling you as a norm, as a practice, as a culture, this is not the mode of operation. So let me ask you, let me do this. Let me talk about what we're not inviting people to. Let's clear that up real quick, and let's just blow through that real quick and obliterate a few things that we think will commonly drive us to invite people to. We're not inviting people to just believe what we believe. You're not going to go to your neighbor. You're not going to talk to a coworker. You're not going to talk to a student in the lunchroom and just invite them to believe what you believe. Because that keeps everything as an intellectual pursuit. It keeps everything about belief and not relationship. It's the right start, but that's not what we're inviting people ultimately to. Believing in Jesus is where it starts, but it's not where it all ends. So we're not inviting them just to believe what we believe. We're not inviting them just to attend the church that we attend. Now I say that with, in, in a, with a parenthetical statement to say this. You should, pe you should be inviting people to worship services with you. You should be. And we're going to challenge you today to do that. But that's not the end, right? That's a means to an end. If you invite people just so that they can get here and sit down and hear the sermon and listen to music and go home and you call it good, then you haven't fulfilled the invitation because the invitation is step one. Come experience a worship service with us. As God's people gather to sing praises, it's a powerful tool of witness. But it is not simply a church recruiting tool. So we're not inviting people just to attend, but that may be a part of it. We're not just as we're not inviting people just to believe. That may be step one. All right? We're not inviting them to get a ticket punched to heaven. All right? We're not just telling people how they can avoid hell. When you talk about just avoiding hell and ending up in heaven, do you know who gets left out of the equation most of the time? Jesus. No, no, he, he's there. But he's how you avoid hell and get to heaven. But he's not about the definition and the atmosphere and the oxygen of heaven. He's how he gets you. Jesus will get you there. And you get to heaven, it's kind of like you think, well, then what? Jesus is then what? But if you don't know Jesus, that doesn't sound very compelling. Okay, Jesus, and what else? Well, I get to see my family. Is my pet there? Are we going to sit on clouds and play harps? Are we going to sing? Do I get to do my favorite hobby? Do I? And we get concerned about all these other things about the possibility of heaven because heaven doesn't sound that exciting except for it's the absence of bad things. But if you know Jesus and you get to know Jesus and you understand Jesus is not just a means to an end, but he is the end, then heaven and Jesus are synonymous. And it's very exciting. What are we inviting them to? So we're not inviting them to just believe what we believe or, or attend the church that we attend or get a ticket punched to heaven. What are we inviting people? When we, when we, listen, when we authentically care, when we humbly serve them and we get the opportunity to clearly invite them into the flow and the current of the gospel of Jesus Christ, what are we inviting them to? Listen to what John said. He said, we proclaim to you. We, this is what he's inviting them to. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. Not what we believe, but what we have seen and heard. Not what we know, but what we've seen and heard. It's experience speaking, firsthand, eyewitness account. So that, why? We invite you to our, the same thing we are experiencing so that you could experience it. That's what he says. We proclaim to you what we've seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. In other words, we invite you to, on the basis of what we've seen and heard, so that you can see and hear it. We invite you to experience what we're experiencing, John said, so that you can experience it. It's very simple, isn't it? It's not about what you memorize in Evangelism Explosion. It's about experience. You know the one void I had on every one of those doorsteps that night as I went around Joshua, Texas? Experience. I was inviting people to things that I knew but had not experienced. Period. Guess how many people picked up on that? About 100%. You can tell when somebody's just talking out of their head. You can tell when somebody's basing their whole 
spiel, their sales pitch, based on intellect and not experience. It defined how I preach, by the way. It helped define how I would communicate to people because I decided once I realized what was going on, I would never communicate only out of my head. It would always be an explosion of the reality of my heart. I don't ever want to do that to somebody. I don't ever want it done to me. You're inviting people. We're inviting others into and to experience the same kind of relationship or fellowship is what John calls it. The same kind of fellowship with God that we're experiencing. That leads to a great question. What kind of fellowship are you experiencing with God? It is very true. You cannot share what you do not have, can you? I can give you a bottle of water that I drank out of because I have one. But I can't give you a Diet Coke right now because I don't have one. And you cannot share an experience with Jesus that you don't have. What did John say we were sharing? Experience with Jesus. Fellowship with Jesus. A real relationship with Jesus. Not just a belief, not a way to get your ticket punched to heaven, but an experience with Jesus. That's authentic. That's real. It's not sinful. Listen, I'm not saying it's sinful to share just intellectually. I'm, not, I'm saying it's ineffective. It doesn't help much to just share what you believe. Because your belief against somebody else's belief what lends it validity. If you just say, well, you believe this. And you can say, well, I believe this. How do you counter that? Well, I'm more right than you are. How do you know? But if you say, no, 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 I want to share with you what I've experienced, then that will get people's attention. It's one thing to sit at Game 7 of the World Series and watch that unfold or watch it in HDTV in my living room. I guarantee you the people sitting at Kauffman Stadium had a whole different, they would report the game in a whole different way than I did. First-hand experience makes all the difference in the world. Here's five bad reasons what we're inviting people to, okay? Here's what we're inviting people to. Now, five bad reasons to invite other people to anything. Obligation. You're ob obligated to invite them because that's what you should do. The pastor preached on it. You know, it's part of being a Christian. We're told that this is simply what a Christian should do. Or pride. We feel good because we feel like we're performing well and for God and others. And we impress people and we impress God when we invite them. That's a bad, bad motive. A bad, bad reason to invite people into the flow of the gospel. Fear. Fear is a bad motivator too. Sometimes it's effective at getting people to move in a direction. But when they move in a direction for the wrong reason, you have to sustain the reason, right? Yeah, if the reason is fear, you have to sustain fear. If you sustain a culture of fear in the church, it wears people out and they finally weary of it, don't they? And they say, I don't want to live in fear. I don't want to be driven by fear. I don't want to be driven by all this stuff. And they stop. And the gospel is not about fear anyway. The Bible says love, perfect love casts out fear. So that's a bad, bad reason to invite other people just because you're afraid of what might happen if we don't invite them. We do this subtly, though. We do this subtly, and this is guilt and fear, by the way. You've heard this before. Well, if you're the only Jesus, they may know. And if you don't invite them, they may spend an eternity in hell. And what people are saying is your fault if somebody else spends eternity in hell. Listen, it's no one's fault if somebody spends an eternity in hell except the person because that's justice for sin. That is just payment. God is not going, you represented me terribly. Every person that spends an eternity separated from God has earned that eternity, period. All we're doing is operating as one beggar, inviting another beggar to find out where we found bread. That's literally all we're doing. So when you use fear and guilt, it doesn't work. Guilt, we feel the shame to. Uh, we don't fulfill our Christian duty to invite others. Or the simple tactic of recruitment. When we become a company or a, or, or a club or an organization, we start inviting people to that. This is common. Hey, come be a part of my church. i got an amazing church. I love my church. love my people. love my pastor. love my music. Come be a part of my church. And we don't even talk about Jesus. And the end goal becomes getting to be a part of the church, the congregation. I'm gonna, it's going to sound confusing because I want you to invite people to worship services. But why you invite people to worship services is really, really important. Because if it's the end goal, the end game, come see the show and go home happy, then don't invite them because that's not the point. You're going to lead them to a false conclusion. But if you invite them as one step closer to enjoying and entering into the journey and the experience that you have with Jesus, this is a profoundly effective way to do it. 
We're going to talk about that more at the end. One good reason to invite people, again, John, John answers this well. What did John say? He said, we write this, we're telling you this, to make our joy complete. Isn't that good? Not fear, not guilt, not obligation, not pride, not a sense of recruitment. But John is basically saying this. We, what we are experiencing in our personal relationship with Jesus, with, with, with the Father, is too good to keep to ourselves. It just, the only way we can adequately get, you know, respond to the joy is to share it with you and to invite you into the same experience. When you are truly enjoying something, you always want to share it with somebody else. That's the motive, that your relationship with Jesus becomes so profound, so rich, so life-altering, so compelling, that it just kind of spills out of your life. Naturally, it's just an overflow. Our coffee pot is kind of tricky back there. It's a gravity-fed coffee pot that leaks a little bit and always keeps water in there. I'm just telling you FYI because we cleaned up a lot of messes. This is a good illustration too, so check this out. If you pour too much water in there because you think a little is leaked out, now here's what I've done is I pour the right amount in and it only fills the coffee pot up half full. Anybody else experience that here? It's a little frustrating. It makes really, really strong coffee. Then you think, well, I'll just add a little bit more, and it'll be all right. But I never get the little bit more, and then it overflows, and we've got coffee on the counter. Which, for a coffee addict, is a dream, right? You just go in there and start licking it off the counter and say, "Woo, that's the overflow. There's some to share. Jesus needs to flow out of our life like that. There's just too much of him to keep to ourselves. The, the joy is too great. The experience is too rich. The purpose is too deep. The meaning is too compelling. you just got to share it. Listen, you can watch this on social media all the time. This is validated on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all that stuff. When something good happens to somebody, or when something bad, frankly, happens, they tweet it, they Instagram it, it's on Facebook. Social media is replete with it. Just watch. See what people share. Now, some people do this, and I'm sorry if you're one of them. I'll just offend you. But if you just tell me what you ate for supper, I just bypass you because I don't really care. I don't. You don't care what I eat for supper. Come on. Unless you're weird. Want to know, what's the pastor eat for supper? Because you're never going to find out on Facebook because I don't tell it. Because I'm too busy eating it. I don't care. But, man, when something good happens, I love to share that with the world. When Jesus happens to you, you're going to want to share him. And I would tell you this, this is not guilt. This is just to get you a way to look at it differently. Could it be the reason you're not sharing Jesus is because you don't have a whole lot to share in your experience with him? Could it be that you're just going through the road motions, fulfilling obligations, doing a religious thing, functioning like a cultural Christian, a member of a spiritual country club, and you don't really feel compelled to invite anybody to anything? But I'm telling you what Jesus is inviting you to, for you to experience if you get in the flow of the current of the gospel, you're going to start inviting people to it. It's the natural byproduct. It's just what happens. We proclaim to you what we've seen and heard because this makes our joy complete. What we're experiencing in our personal relationship with Jesus is just too good to keep to ourselves. So how can we invite people? What do you mean? How do we do this? Are we inviting them to church? Are we inviting them to the gospel? What are we doing? What are we doing? What are you talking about? Here's what, ultimately, listen, this is so important. I'm talking about how, but I want you to remember what. We are inviting people to experience the same Jesus that we are experiencing in our lives. You want them to have what you have. If you don't care if they have what you have, then what you have is not the full gospel of Jesus because it's life-altering. I'm telling you this. This is a fact. You cannot get into the current of the gospel of Jesus Christ and not find yourself blown away by it. Remember the, this, I, I, I wish I had the reference better, but in Acts, it's Peter and somebody, I'm sorry, just sharing with you my biblical illiteracy. Are told to stop speaking. Oh, it's after they heal the lame beggar. They're told to stop speaking in Jesus' name. He, Peter said this. We can't help sharing what we've seen and heard. Peter, stop or we're going to punish you. I'm sorry. I, I can't help it. Sharing what I've seen and heard. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? 
When's the last time your relationship has been so real, so overflowing, so rich, that you couldn't help but talking about Jesus? Not a guilt trip. I'm asking myself the question. It's not a guilt trip. Evaluation tool. Seriously. Just look. Think about it. Peter said, I just, I can't help it. Do to me what you will. I can't help it. It's like breathing. I can't help it. I have to breathe. I have to talk about Jesus. He didn't memorize two questions. He didn't memorize 15 scriptures and six rebuttals and 12 good illustrations. He just walked with Jesus. Remember what Jesus invited you to do? What did he invite? Follow him. What else? Nothing. Follow him. Get up every day and follow him. Remember that following Jesus is still about proximity. You're staying hooked up to him. You're staying connected to him. You're listening to the Holy Spirit and saying, Jesus, I want to go where you go. If you go to Walmart, I'm going to Walmart. Funny thing, uh, Kelly had to pick up uh, Braden at a party uh, Halloween night. And we were over some other people's houses. And I went home, took the younger two, and she was just going to stay out. And uh, I don't know where this is going, but it's kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> She, she's going to stay out and just wait for Braden and then you'll get him because she's going to drive back into town because our bridge is still out. Did I tell you our bridge is out on K4 since May? Y'all know that. Since May. I'm, I'm almost going to have a schism over this. But anyway, she stayed out. And I said, what would you do? She said, well, I just sat in the McDonald's parking lot. Everything's closed. I said, Why don't you go to Walmart? And she goes, go to Walmart on Halloween night at 1130? I was like, yeah. Where else would you want to go on Halloween? On Walmart. <laughs> Wouldn't it be awesome? It's like Halloween there every night at 1130. <laughs> That's the truth. I said, I don't know where that went. I just had to tell that story. I had somewhere when it started, but, you know, it's gone now. Point being that, listen, follow me here. How do we invite people? And what are we inviting them to? What are you inviting people to? All right? Now, you're inviting them to join the journey. It's too good. It's too good to not share it. How do you do it? Three things. I want you to remember this phrase. I really feel like the Spirit of God has given us this to embrace. Okay? I didn't read this in a book. This is just pastor praying and asking God how to answer this question well. So I'm going to share it with you. I want you to look at it and tell me if it resonates with you. Care authentically. I've already said these several times, but I want you to look at this. Here's how you invite people. You have to care authentically. That means you don't care as a means to an end or as a tool. You care because you care. Because you're becoming more like Jesus, you start caring. Okay? That means you listen well. You pray for and with others. You care. I was with Roger the other day, and um, we were in the office. There were several people, and we... Uh, Rogers came and said, what can I pray for you all about? And we shared something, and Rogers stopped right then and prayed for it. Right then. Not because he felt obligated to, but he cared. It's a good example. Maybe you listen well. If you care, you listen. If you don't care, you don't listen. Spend time with people. All right, care authentically. Serve humbly. That is, when you serve people, when you do something in the name of Jesus, do it without letting your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Don't put it on Facebook. Don't tweet it. Don't toot your own horn. Just do it. Okay? God's got it. You're not doing it for other people. You're doing it to bless somebody else and to lead them to the gospel. You're inviting them into the current of the gospel. And lastly, this is the part we've got to get. This is the part. Listen, we're, we're pretty good at the first two at covenant, caring and sharing. Pretty good. Man, if we had that, if that's all it took. But what we're not good at is inviting people clearly into a relationship with Jesus. We're not good at that. We just think they'll get it somehow by osmosis or just because we did a good thing. The atheists adopted this park down here. They're doing a good thing, aren't they? Keeping part of our city clean. You can be frustrated at them if you want to. That the atheists got to sign up down here. But I'm telling you, they're doing a good thing. Is it going to lead people to Jesus? No. Is you doing a good thing without inviting them to Jesus going to get them to Jesus? No. The world's full of people doing good stuff. You have to invite them. You have to have a clear, compelling invitation. We care and we serve because that's the kind of people we're becoming, not because it's a tactic or a manipulative, manipulative tool. So how tragic if we care for and serve others 
out of the overflow of our relationship with Jesus, but we never invite them to experience the source of our love and the source of our service, which is Jesus. That's the whole reason we do it, all right? So growing and going, listen, church, growing and going is not a motto that we've adopted because we think we need a new motto. Growing and going is descriptive of the vision that God has embedded in our hearts, that as we grow and become like Jesus, we will go through life like Jesus. Growing is becoming like Jesus. Going is acting like Jesus. As you grow, you will go. It's an inevitable thing. We're not teaching you to go and then grow. We're teaching you to grow and then you will go. It's an inevitable thing. If you put gas in a car that has no gas and you turn the ignition and everything works fine, it's going to start. It's an inevitable result of everything being in place. If you grow, if you become like Jesus, you will go like Jesus. You will go through life like Jesus. We don't have to prescribe it. We don't have to take you through evangelism and explosion and divide you up into teams and go annoy 50 people one night. You can just, you will just invade the world with Jesus who is changing your world and your life. That's a fact. It's a harder evangelism strategy to do because I'm not in control of it. We can't orchestrate it. We can't program it. We can't measure it. We can't monitor it. We can't constantly evaluate whether you're doing it or not. But it's the only evangelism strategy that will ever, ever change Topeka, Kansas with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the only one. Nothing else will happen. So I'm going to ask us to turn a corner as a church today, and I'm going to ask you to begin. And I want to preface this. Everything we need to, to reach this city for, for Jesus is in place. We have a healthy, functioning congregation of people who love each other and love Jesus. We have a structure that allows us to sustain numerical and spiritual growth and to develop new leaders. We have a vision that is clear and compelling. Everything we need to do it. Now, the, the, the enemy is going to come in and say, great job, great job. Y'all just sit back and enjoy it now because he doesn't care if we enjoy it. He's lost the battle with us anyway, so he's just going to applaud you and say, sit and soak. And man, just enjoy the music. Got a great music guy like your pastor. He's been there nine years. Woo, y'all are comfortable. Everything's good. Don't do anything else. But God has got his foot on our back saying, now. Go invade Topeka, Kansas with the gospel. Now is the time to go share the Jesus that is overflowing in your life. Now is the day. So our next step as a church family is to turn our attention to the people in our lives who do not yet know Jesus as we authentically care for them, as we humbly serve them, and as we clearly invite them to know and follow Jesus. That's what we do. Now there are many ways to offer invitations and to care. Many, many ways. And there's a lot of ways. And I was going to go through some of those ways. But I've got to get to the end of this because there's something important I want to share with you. But I want you to remember this as you share. Because I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a tool at the end of this to share. But I want you to remember something before we go there. It's not up to you to get somebody saved. That's not your job. Acts 1.8 didn't say go into all the world and get people saved. It said go into all the world and be my witnesses. Only God can rescue a person from the guilt of their sin. And only you can be a personal witness to them. An invitation to know and follow Jesus may not be, it may not start with a verbal invitation. It may start with your authentic concern for somebody. It may start with humble service for them. But it's got to end up in you somehow clearly inviting them to know and follow the Jesus that is changing your life. So here's your challenge. I want you to pray for and intentionally listen to the Holy Spirit. You're learning this in your G2 groups, and bless you, bless you, bless you for embracing this. this is a radical change. But to listen every day for the voice of the Holy Spirit to give you direction and to lead you to opportunities to authentically care for, humbly serve, and clearly invite others. Not one of the three. That's the process. If you're going to be a person who's going to be an effective witness in somebody's life, you will be a person who genuinely cares for people. You are humbly will serve them, and you will clearly invite them to know and follow Jesus. Not just come to a church, not just attend your G2 group, not just come to a ministry event, but to know and follow Jesus. Okay, that's your challenge. Now here's a tool, and there's a challenge with this. We have a new tool called True Life. We signed up for this almost a year ago. And we're now bringing it to fruition. True Life is an organization that uh, is equipping us. This is just one tool, okay? This is not our strategy. This is just one tool we're going to give you. But I think it's a compelling one. And, and as I preface this, I want to remind you, inviting people to a worship service as, as a step towards inviting them to know and follow Jesus is profoundly effective. Very effective. And should be done on a regular basis. 
Now, I've, I've pastored churches. This isn't one of them. But I have pastored churches in the past that I wouldn't invite people to. Because what they experience when they get there would be counterproductive to the gospel. That's not the case here. You have everything you need to invite somebody to a worship service. Why would you do that? Why don't you just, why don't you just tell them they're lost and they need Jesus and they've got to get saved? Hey, if the Holy Spirit leads you to go that way, go for it. But if the Holy Spirit says, hey, let them experience some genuine worship with other people who are authentic and care for them and get them in that atmosphere. There's something powerful about congregational worship. Then this is a great tool to use. It's called True Life. Do we have that? Um, the, yeah, that's all on your listening guide. I wanted to go straight to the website. TrueLife.org. Now, here's what this is. It's a, you can keep these in your billfold, and we're going to hand you five of them at the end of this service. But these are little, really well-done cards. They look like this. They TrueLife.org, and TrueLife has a website. And on the website, there are a multiplicity of a bunch of questions with video responses to them. Now, here's what I want you to know about this. If, you're, if you are uh, talking to somebody at a, at a gas station... And you ever do this when you're in, in line? Maybe it's somebody in line behind you, or maybe it's a clerk, and you're at Walmart or Dillon's or someplace, and you just know they're having a terrible, terrible day, and you say, how are you doing? And they just, they're honest. They say, uh, you know, they just grumble, and you're like, well, I can't really go through the whole plan of salvation as they're checking me out here, and I can say I'm praying for you, but what else can I do? This is a great opportunity to say, hey, I just want to, I'm with Covenant Baptist Church, and love for you to visit us sometime, but I also want you to know if you just go to this website and you just need some encouragement, you can look at all kinds of topics on this website from depression to fear to Mormonism to, to homosexuality to science in the Bible to evolution to why bad things happen to good, in good people, why does God allow evil and suffering. All these questions are there, and you can look at them right there. They're all on there. Now, those are high-quality, well-done short videos from 3 to 20 minutes, depending on the need and the explanation. You can just say, hey, check that out. And if you, I'll be back in here, and if you want, if you want to uh, contact us, our church com contact information is on the back of this card. If you've got questions, uh, you can do that. Or you can just simply say, hey, I'm excited about what God's doing in my church, and I would love to invite to you to Covenant Baptist Church. And you can hand them this card and say, by the way, if you have any questions, you want to look at them from scriptural response, check this website out. It's a great way to invite people to maximize brief Brief encounters. Also, a way to invite people. If you've ever been in a conversation when somebody's raised a hard topic and you don't have a good answer and you're just sitting there as a Christian going, I don't want to wade in because I'm afraid I don't know the answer, and say, so, you know what? You can stand up in that crowd and say, I don't really know the answer to that question very well. I'm not really prepared to do that. But I do know that this is a really good place to go. Would you check this out? And then let's discuss. Uh, go to this. This has a topic on this. Go to this website and, and let's get back together and talk about it. I'll go look at it too. Now here's what I want you to know about this. If, if it's a sensitive subject like homosexuality or Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses, these are well, well done with great respect. These are not belittling people. They're done with great... They start off the whole one about Mormonism talking about all the positive aspects of Mormonism and there are lots of them. Same with Jehovah's Witnesses. And... And listen to this. You may be offended by this. I think it's profoundly good. The one that is dealing with homosexuality, the guy gets on there and says, I am a man who is attracted to men. He didn't say I'm a recovering homosexual. He said, I, this is my problem. Because you could stand up and say your problem too in the same way. You know, I'm a man that, that struggles with lust or I'm a woman that struggles with coveting. You know, we all struggle with it. But he deals with it from a very sensitive, very respectful, but very straight on way. So I want you to check it out. I'm going to ask you to take five of these cards. We've got them in the back. And this week, I want you to pray and listen to the Holy Spirit to, for opportunities to, to do that. Okay? To give out five of these cards just every day, Monday through Friday. Say, God, show me somebody that I can hand this card to. If you give all five out on Monday, come back. We'll give you some more. Okay? But this, the cool thing is that they go on there. It's got something called Church Finder on the back. And it's got all the churches who are members of True Life in our area. They can punch in a zip code and say, I want to go to a church that's a part of this. And it'll list our name address, gives a link to our website. Very, very, very well done. Now, is this our evangelism strategy? No. Is this one tool that you can use to help clearly invite people toward a relationship with Jesus? Absolutely. If you don't want to use it, that's just fine. If you just want to do it a different way, that's fine. Just remember, what we're inviting people to is not joining a club. It's not joining a church. It's not a political affiliation or a religious affiliation. We're inviting people to know and follow Jesus like we are. That's what Jesus said would be the outcome if we followed him. So if you're following Jesus, you'll become what? A fisher of men. What's a fisher of men live like? They live in pursuit of the best interest of other people, even at the expense of their own benefit and cost. Pray with me. 
Father, you are good. And we bow before you because you're the king of heaven and earth. And we're not here to promote our agenda but yours. We're here to invite people into a life-altering relationship with Jesus that is so compelling, so real, so satisfying to our soul and our spirit that it erupts. When we get into it and we get experience with Jesus, it erupts. It does. It's, not, it's inevitable. We can't stop it. Help us to, to know right now that it's not to just enjoy, but it's to share. Help us to clearly invite people as we humbly serve them and authentically care about them. Jesus, would you use us to push back the darkness in our city, in our state, even, Father, in our country and the world? In Jesus' great name, amen. Hey, I'm serious. At the end, I want everybody to get five of those cards. We're gonna, I'm going to stand over there and I'll make sure everybody gets five. If you give them out, that's up to you, but I'm going to give them to you. Okay, we'll get five of them for you. Jeremy and I put paper clips on fives this morning, a lot of paper clips. Don't, don't make our fingers bleed for nothing, all right? I want you to get five of them before you leave. What you do with them after that is really up to you and the Holy Spirit. It really is. I mean that. I'm not going to check on you. But, man, we're going to ask for opportunities to share your stories if you've invited people next week, okay? All right. I want you to respond to what God's leading you to do. If you don't know Jesus, we want to introduce you to Jesus. We really do. We want you to know the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Savior of the whole entire universe. He's redeeming everything. Man, he's redeeming this planet. He's redeeming the stars. He's the, the atmosphere. But at the center of all that's you. He's redeeming you. He's giving you a new life. He's offering it to you on a platter of grace. He wants you to have it. He's in pursuit of you. If you don't have it, would you, would you tap me on the shoulder today and just say, Pastor, I want to know more about Jesus. Or Tom over there, AJ over there, any of these. The mentors right here. We could talk to you. We'd love to talk to you. Grab me afterwards. It's 30 minutes. We're going to have 30 minutes together. Maybe not quite 30 minutes because we're going to do communion today. But we'll have 25 minutes together in just a minute. Grab somebody and say, I need to know about Jesus. I want to know about him today. Okay? Let's spend a couple minutes just responding to the Spirit of God.